Stalin section, concentrate all our strength against the principal enemy. Quote, one of the fundamental qualities of the Bolsheviks, and one of the fundamental points of our revolutionary strategy, is our ability to understand, at any given moment, who is the principal enemy, and to know how to concentrate all our strength against that enemy. End quote. From the report to the 7th Congress of the Communist International. Subsection 1. Democracy and Peace? It's worthwhile to begin with the Cold War. To specify the time we are dealing with, I'll limit myself to several details. In January of 1952, to break the stalemate in military operations in Korea, U.S. President Harry S. Truman flirted with a radical idea that was even written down in a diary entry. He could send an ultimatum to the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China, specifying in advance that their lack of compliance, quote, would mean that Moscow, St. Petersburg, Mukden, Vladivostok, Beijing, Shanghai, Port Arthur, Dalian, Odessa, Stalingrad, and every industrial center in China and the Soviet Union would be eliminated. End quote. It was not a matter of fantasy with no connection to reality, as disturbing as that may be. In those years, nuclear weapons had been repeatedly wielded as a threat against a China determined to complete its anti-colonial revolution and achieve national independence and territorial integrity. The threat was all the more believable due to the terrible and lingering memory of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, when Japan had its attention primarily turned to the Soviet Union. On this, authoritative American historians agree. It also wasn't only the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China being threatened. On May the 7th, 1954, in Dien Bien Phu, Vietnam, an army led by the Communist Party defeated colonialist France's occupying troops. On the eve of the battle, the American Secretary of State Foster Dulles said to French Prime Minister Georges Bidot, quote, and what if we were to give you two atomic bombs? End quote. It was understood immediately that they were to be used against Vietnam. Despite not even hesitating at the prospect of a nuclear holocaust to hold back the anti-colonial revolution, an essential constitutive element of the democratic revolution, in those same years, the United States and its allies sold NATO as a contribution to the cause of democracy and peace. It must be placed in this context, the speech in March of 1949 by Togliatti to the Chamber of Deputies during the debate over Italy's entry into the Atlantic Alliance. Beginning of long quote. Your principal thesis is that democracies, as you call them, don't wage wars. But gentlemen, who do you take us for? Do you truly believe that we don't have the most minimal political and historical background? It's not true that democracies don't wage wars. All the colonial wars of the 19th and 20th centuries were waged by regimes that classified themselves as democratic, such as when the United States waged a war of aggression against Spain to establish its rule in a part of the world it was interested in. It waged war against Mexico to conquer specific regions where there were substantial sources of raw materials. For decades, they waged war on the indigenous Native American tribes in order to destroy them offering one of the primary examples of the crime of genocide that is today judicially enshrined and thus should be legally punished in the future. End quote. Nor must one forget, quote, the crusade by 19 nations, as Churchill had called it at the time, against Soviet Russia, and there was also, before the eyes of the world, France's war against Vietnam, at that time fully underway. Therefore, far from being synonymous with peace, bourgeois democracies had started and continued to be responsible for wars that often had a genocidal character. In any case, from the Italian communist leader's point of view, to believe in the thesis according to which bourgeois democracy would be free of military impulses would mean having no, quote, political or cultural background. But that background would truly disappear a few decades later. During the outbreak of the First War against Iraq, while the Italian Communist Party was beginning to crumble, one of its prominent philosophers, 
Giacomo Maramao, declared to La Unita on January the 25th, 1991, quote, Never in history has a democratic state waged war on another democratic state, end quote. The tone of that declaration didn't allow for responses or doubts. Yet I will allow myself to cite Henry Kissinger, regarding whom there are many things to be criticized, but not being, quote, politically or historically uncultured. Beginning a long quote. When the First World War broke out in Europe, most countries, including Great Britain, France, and Germany, were governed by what were essentially democratic institutions. Nevertheless, the First World War, a catastrophe which Europe still hasn't completely recovered from, was enthusiastically approved by all the democratically elected parliaments. End quote. In truth, war has not even spared those that define themselves as the oldest democracies in the world. Great Britain and the United States were at war from 1812 to 15. And on that occasion, it is even one of the founding fathers of the American Republic, namely Thomas Jefferson, who invokes against Great Britain a total and, quote, eternal war, a war that could only come to an end with the, quote, extermination of one side or the other, end quote. And it's not just a matter of a now-distant historical event. Even between the two world wars, for some time the United States continued to consider Great Britain as its most likely enemy. The war plans they prepared in 1930, and approved by General Douglas MacArthur, even considered the use of chemical weapons. End of section.